Hi everybody, welcome to Drag Racing's Golden Era. My name is Randy, I am the Editor-in-Chief here, and you are watching yet another episode of Dry Hops. Tonight's episode is about tiny tires. In case some of you don't remember, about 1986, Don Garlitz put these little tiny aircraft tires on his dragster. I believe it was Swamp Rat 30. Now they didn't start out that way. Don was looking for some aerodynamic advantage on the front of his car, and he went to what first at Gainesville in 1986 was a spun aluminum wheel that had a rubber belt attached to it, but he had all kinds of problems with that, and we'll get into that. But first, as usual in the booth tonight, turning all the knobs and dials is my brother Thad, controlling the program, and our gaffer and talent coordinator is Mike Couch, and he is in the house with us tonight too. So let's get on with this with the tiny tires. So the first thing I did to research the tiny tires on the front of dragsters that happened in the middle and late 80s was I called Big Daddy Don Garlitz himself because he's the guy who sort of started it. There's been many different interpretations about why Big Daddy went with that cowl and went with the tiny little tires, and one of them was that he was chasing 300 trying to punch a hole through the air with that. While that's partially true, this is what Big Daddy had to tell me. He said that in 85, he was standing down at the finish line uh, with some media. Media wanted to interview him after a qualifying session. Qualifying for the funny cars had just started, and he watched a set of funny cars come by. There had been an accident, and they had used, uh, what was it they used, Mike? Yeah, yeah, that's it. They used rice hull ash to clean up the oil that was put down on the track. And if you guys remember back then, after they cleaned up a wreck, there was usually a white line of dust left on the track after they got it all swept off and cleaned up. So Big Daddy's standing down there at the finish line, and he sees this pair of funny cars coming, and he notices something. That rice uh, hull ash out in front of the funny car is being blown away about two to three feet in front of that funny car. With the low, you know, sitting body and the aerodynamics of it, the wind is pushing about two to three feet out in front of that funny car. And he can literally see the rice hull ash getting pushed away uh, about that distance out in front of the car. He didn't think a whole lot of it. Uh, continued with his interview. And by the time he was done with his interview with the media, top fuel dragsters were back on the track doing uh, some qualifying and he noticed something really odd. He said that the first pair that came down with the rice hull ash, he said that about 20 to 30 feet out in front of that dragster, that ash was getting blown around. In other words, that dragster was pushing air 20 to 30 feet out in front of it. And he said to himself, well, that's just ridiculous. We got to do something about this. So let's fast forward to 1986, Gainesville. Big Daddy shows up at the drag strip, and this is what it looked like. Now this is the most unusual front end configuration that we have ever seen. Certainly the narrowest track, and also tiny, tiny front wheels, only 13 inches. Everybody else's are about 22, especially built front wheels that don't even have tires on them, just kind of a, an industrial style V-belt. Now this whole front body piece is carbon fiber and only weighs four pounds. And Don says that its shape will punch a hole in the wind that he's gonna drive right through, not just to 270, but 280 miles per hour. Now, Don didn't read any books or consult any engineers or wind tunnels. This is common sense and swamp science. And that was right there the start of Don Garlitz going to smaller tires. However, trying to get through that race, he did win that race, but trying to get through that race was a real challenge for him with some untested technology, as we can see here. A couple of unique vehicles, but all eyes were on the Garlitz car off the line looking as if it was running without front tires he won easily 544 264 miles an hour but it was a victory that came not without major penalties steve had a look well, in qualifying last week, and Don Garlitz had some problems with the front tires, if you can even call it a tire, and it appears that there's a problem again, as uh, the rubber that he had applied over that V-belt has apparently come apart and done some damage to the front end. It'll be interesting to see uh, if they can repair this and run in the second round. This could be a problem that could conceivably put him out of the race. We'll follow this story. 
Well, he changed some things on the car, uh, tried a polyurethane strip on there, but in the end, what he found he had to do was switch over to a aircraft landing tire, and it looked like this. In this sport, as we watch Big Daddy Don Garlitz get set to go, he has had a series of tire problems with his revolutionary car. Earlier, I had a chance to look at his latest solution. You remember the Gator Nationals when Don Garlitz appeared with his revolutionary front end, the streamliner that carried him to victory. But remember, he had some tire problems. The uh, 13 and a half inch spun aluminum wheels kept throwing treads. Don returned to the Southern Nationals with a different setup, a polyurethane strip on the wheels. It worked a little bit better, but he still wasn't happy. Now here at the Cajun Nationals, he's come with what he thinks is the real solution. These are aircraft tires, actually nose wheels off an aircraft, that have been tested up to 317 miles an hour without failure. They're 505 Goodyear airplane wheels, work perfectly for this particular setup, and Garlitz is very, very pleased. Actually, the same OD, the outside diameter of the wheel is still 13 and a half inches, so it fits underneath his streamlined nose, just like the old ones. But the stability, and more importantly, Don says the soft ride that he gets with these uh, uh, relatively low pressure tires helps handling so Garlitz ever vigilant ever leading the way is on his way to yet another breakthrough in the sport but I'll guarantee you one thing this is only the beginning so Big Daddy had told me that the reason why the NHRA probably banned him in the end was because the bearing temperatures you know those little tires spinning at that kind of speed the bearing temperatures got really really high on them and they what who no, we don't do call-ins on the show here. Who's call why would why do we have a call-in in the middle of the show? Who is it? Steve Gibbs. Oh. Well, <laughs> we have a call-in from Steve Gibbs. Uh can we get him up on video? Well, let's do that. Hold on just a second. We're going to bring Steve Gibbs in here to discuss this subject with us. All right, so now it's my pleasure to welcome the former competition director for the NHRA for 30 years to our program, and he wants to talk about what he saw when it came to the little tires, and he spent all that time running these races and getting things done, so he was the man on the front line witnessing what went on. So I guess the first thing um, I, that comes to mind was, was there, Steve, was there a rule uh, with the NHRA against having, you know, when he went to that bill of tire, was there any kind of rule against that? There was no rule. I mean, it was an effort by him. Everybody wanted to go 300. So nobody had gone 300 miles an hour. And Garlis had this concept of this weird front end that he had designed, kind of a, I called it a spoon nose, kind of an upside down spoon. Yep. And to, to use that nose, he had to have a small wheel. It, you know, so that, that just went with the, the body design is what dictated the wheel, really. And that that wheel didn't work, um, and uh, nobody else would have got by with that. He won the race. Okay, he won the race, peeling that little neoprene band uh, off every every run. But he wound up winning, winning the event. Well, then he came up with a little airplane wheel and tire. It was a small diameter landing gear, you know, wheel for a small airplane, and that's what he wound up using. And he tried that front end still. And eventually the front end didn't work. He had two bad, bad blowovers, you know, and that thing when it got up, well, then he abandoned the nose piece, but he still had those little wheels. And at that point they were doing him, they weren't serving the original purpose. You know, they were basically designed for the nose and being garlets, everybody, you know, and he's winning, he's running good. Well, everybody, copycat and and went along with these little wheels and they were really a negative uh impact it, it kind of got kind of interesting when you talk about the uh the details of what the effect of that was and more in timing than safety but it, uh, it affected reaction times it affected elapsed times it affected who run the first five second uh, run in the sport um uh, it got a little bit crazy and um uh, and a lot of guys still, I think, to this day, don't understand, really. It gets to be a little complicated, but it's pretty interesting, too. I, I, the, the things that you just mentioned would have never even occurred to me. The, you know, with right. you know how that car is aligned on the starting line, how it crosses the finish line. I know that that never even occurred to me. 
No, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's a pretty, it gets a little complicated and kind of hard to follow. And it's amazing how many guys that spend millions of dollars to run these cars. There's elements outside their car that they, they really don't, you know, understand or what the impact was on that thing. And it, it's, um, it can be huge. So uh, well, I, don't I, I, I don't remember blowovers before. You know, I remember dragsters getting up on their side on their hind hind end, yeah. but I don't remember any blowers before Garlitz went to those wheels. I, I'm not sure the wheels had anything to do with the blowers. I think that nose piece Garlitz had once the car got up in the air, it give it a bigger scoop to uh, tip it over. But you know, there were quite a few blowovers, and uh, uh, at that time. Most of those guys were running those little wheels. I don't think the little wheels necessarily caused the blowover. Okay. Uh, the biggest impact, safety-wise, I'm not so sure they were the safest. Uh, uh, I mean, you're taking that little bitty thing, spinning that thing at 300 miles an hour, that bearing has to be saying help, you know. it's. Uh, um, <clears throat> but when you get into the timing details, that's where it really gets interesting. You know, first of all, you have to kind of understand the whole concept of rollout and what the timing, you know, how that works. Uh, and so basically, we're talking about the stage light. You get the pre stage light, which basically tells you where you're at on the racetrack. Now, the stage light is everything. And there's two things that happen in that stage light. When the starter hits the switch, it activates the reaction timer. When you leave that stage light, that stops reaction timer. So now if you got a big tire and wheel, you're going to have more rollout. It's going to take longer for that clock to stop. On paper, you're going to have a worse reaction time. You get that little wheel, you get out of that light quicker, you get a quicker reaction time. The nose of the car is basically in the same place. You haven't really gained any length on the racetrack, but on paper, the driver feels good, man. And it's, and we're talking probably about three hundredths of a second, maybe four hundredths of a second. Okay, that stage light. Now, what happens when you move out of that stage light? It starts the elapsed time clock. Okay. So now, if you got more rollout, it's going to take a little bit longer to start that clock. You're going to be a little farther down the track. You're going to improve your elapsed time by that same three or four hundreds. It's a direct trade-off, okay? So that little wheel is gonna give you a better reaction time and it's gonna kill ET somewhat. So it the driver gets real confused. We had a named driver. Again, the, the nose of the car is in the same place and that's what stops the finish line clocks. Uh, Knowing that you'll get a better elapsed time with the big wheel and tire, we'll say, well, we'll qualify with the big wheels and tires because it'll give us a little better elapsed time. And that three, that three or four hundreds can be the difference between lane choice. It can be the difference between qualifying position. I mean, it's a, and these wheels are tight, so you don't want to give up any elapsed time. But then we'll put the little tires on for the race because we'll get a better reaction time. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's true, okay? But you're giving up the elapsed time, so you may lose lane choice. You're running a bigger risk of getting the red light. Again, it, it, so it get real confusing. And these guys, they, you know, they're playing mental games with themselves until somebody finally figured out that, the bigger wheel is a better deal in, in, in pro categories. Now, um, you get into super categories and deep staging, it, gets, <laughs> it can yeah. get either complicated. We're just talking top fuel dragster here now. There's a good chance, and I'd have to, uh, there's no way to really back it up, but let's say John Doe had a top fuel car before anybody had run in the fours. You know, Kenny Bernstein, or no, you know, you know Eddie Hill. Eddie Hill was the first guy to run a legitimate four-second run. Everybody recognizes it. He did it with the little wheels. Yeah. But there's a good chance somebody else could have gone out there and run 502, 503 with a little wheel. Had they had the big wheel and tire, they could have been the first car to run in the fours. Oh. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it's all conjecture. But it's amazing, you know, the impact those things had. 
I hated the damn things just from an appearance standpoint. They, to me, they didn't look like they belonged on a race car. It looked like go-kart tires. But um, when we got talking about wheel pants and the impact that they had on the sport, you know, that was primarily appearance. And I got thinking, well, these little front deals that were a byproduct of Don Garlett's effort to go 300, he, his, his goal was to punch his way through the the 300 mile an hour barrier with that front end design, which didn't work, but left us with these little wheels. It, um, and eventually they changed the rule where the wheel had to be a bigger diameter. And to me, I, you know, I'm glad they did. Well, it, I re, as I recall during that period, I, I don't remember if everyone was running them, but I do remember there were a lot of cars running them. Did oh, yeah, everyone have them at that point? No, no, not everyone. Yeah, no. and there was a couple racers that says these guys are they're you know they're full of themselves. And Frank Bradley was one of them. Frank Bradley's a smart guy, and um, and he just uh, you know he these guys are kidding themselves. They're getting a better reaction time, but they're giving up a lapse time. And there's you know there's it, it made all sense in the world when you finally figured it out. We were at Houston one day, and I saw Dick LaHaye down on the starting line, and he had the little front wheels, and he had a He's out there before the race had even started. He was down there rolling that little wheel in the light, and, and then he rolled the big wheel in the light. Um, he says, you know, these things aren't helping me out. He he finally took a little while for LaHaye to figure it out. Smart guy. I mean, you're talking about a smart guy. But, again, and you kind of have to understand how you know the lights work to make sense. And it is, on the ET, too, uh, the nose of the car is everything. Almost every car has got an overhang, and that's what stops the elapsed time clock. It's you know it started with the wheel, but it stopped with the nose of the car. And we tried for years to make it where the tire and wheel stop. Uh, you, you can't do it. It's just the clearance down there. The cars on the ground. So ultimately, we had to make the decision to where all the cars, the elapsed time clock is stopped with the body. So it. For a seemingly simple thing, it gets kind of complicated. And uh, and when you get the classes where there's a breakout, that <laughs> that further complicates the matter. But for just top fuel, the unlimited deal, um, I think there's a, probably a pretty good chance that uh, I think Amato and a couple other guys were tickling on that, uh, you know, uh, four-second run. And they could have easily, uh, if they had had the bigger – because also in the dragsters, you got a two-inch offset on an axle, which further enhances that rollout. So that rollout, that's a big, big deal. And you guys lose lane choice. They lose uh, what order they run in. I mean, there's a there's no reward for reaction time uh, as far as a, a, a benefit when it comes time to lane choice or qualifying. There definitely is for a lap time. But in so. Big Daddy fashion... Everything he did was over the top, wasn't it? So, English Town, Summer Nationals, what happened to Big Daddy? It's what Steve Gibbs had talked about was that spoon, he called it a spoon, spoon-shaped front end on the front of that car. She grabbed the wind and over she went. With the touch of a true master of his craft, Garlitz regained control and drove the car through the cloud of tire smoke back toward the starting line. The streamlined dragster came through the crash in remarkably good condition, considering the potential for damage. Garlitz calmly went about the task of shutting down the engine, unbuckled his safety belts, and climbed from the cockpit, giving the cheering fans a victory salute. While we were showing you that segment, I asked Mike Couch, I said, hey, you guys were at the starting line there. You and your dad and the rest of the crew were at the starting line. That dragster is under power coming back at the starting line. What were you guys thinking? And I tell you what he said they were thinking was the first thing on their mind was, oh, my God, how are we going to clear all these people off the starting line so that dragster doesn't come back up here and run everybody over? There was a real thought in their head that Don Garlitz had been possibly knocked unconscious and that car was going to continue up the track under power. And uh, it was a holy crap kind of moment. You know, the blowovers were something else. You know, we'd seen dragsters stand up on their rear tires and do weird stuff. As a matter of fact, Big Daddy's huge blowover that he had at E-Town wasn't the first one of its kind. Actually, one was captured on camera and it looked like this.
Well, it's been another very interesting episode of Dry Hops, hasn't it? Um, conclusions? I don't know what the conclusions are. I will agree with uh, Steve Gibbs when he said that, you know, they just, <laughs> didn't, just didn't really look very good. And I agree with that. Those tires just did not look very good on dragsters. There were a lot of guys that ran them, though. You know, uh, the, it wasn't everybody, but there were a lot of guys that ran them. And uh, like what Steve said, it ended up not actually being an advantage for anybody to have them on the car. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that tiny tires were started as a way to try and gain some aerodynamic advantage and try to punch a hole through the air with that front cowl on Big Daddy's car. And you know how it is in drag racing. It's follow the leader. Once somebody does it, everybody's got to do it. And it wasn't to their advantage. And eventually the NHRA banned them. So that's our episode on little tiny tires. We're glad that you joined us this week for Dry Hops. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. We have no idea what's going to happen next week. I'm going to pick a subject here and we'll... Get researching on it, and we'll get you some good answers to a new subject. So till then, we'll see you all later.